thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here virtually today, and I would like to thank the organizers for the kind introduction and for like like for the for the invitation and for, for yeah for having me here. And um, yeah, I'm excited being part of this workshop. So. Um, I was asked um, today to talk about the topic of yeah combining optical meta surfaces with two dimensional materials and um, yeah I very much like to do so so that's what my talk will be about. Um, for those of you who um, know me a bit, maybe note that um, my affiliation has changed a little bit. So I recently moved within the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena um, to the Institute of Solid State Physics. Um, yeah, previously I was found at the Institute of Applied Physics, so it's not really far, but um, yeah, <laughs> it's now a different institute. All right. So yeah, so I want to do this in the beginning so that there's no um, yeah no chance to to forget it in the end when time is running out. Of course, all that I'm going to show was a team effort. It was a yeah um, many collaborations um, that led to all these results. And I particularly want to thank the groups um, like within the Friedrich Schiller University. Um, maybe I want to flag Andre Tochanin's group because um, they are working in physical chemistry, like growing the 2D materials. So um, yeah, really in all of the works that I'm showing, we relied on their um, products. Yeah, and then we also have some international collaborations, for instance, with Australian National University that contributed to these works. This is my outline. I will start with a relatively short motivation introduction. Um, you've been talking about meta surfaces, or we've been talking about meta surface already all day. So um, I will keep the introductory part here quite um, short, like, but yeah, trying to give a bit um, my motivation and, and flavor of what we're doing. Um, and then I will talk about three topics, um, light emitting meta surfaces, nonlinear meta surfaces, and ultra thin optical meta surfaces, all yeah, leveraging the capabilities provided by the 2D materials. Yeah, and in the end, it's not in the list, but there will be a very short conclusions and outlook. So yeah, allow, you, allow me to give you my my view on what an optical meta surface is, of course, you all know very well now. Yeah, but um, so it's basically a sheet of nanoscale thickness. Maybe I get a pointer just a second. That would help. Yeah. So here oriented out of the plane of your screen. Yeah. And then you come in with a known input light field and the meta surface transforms that into an output light field with desired properties, which can be spectrum, polarization, wavefront and so on. And yeah, especially as you all know, like the capability of a meta surface to engineer a wavefront with all the wavefront shaping um, devices that are out there um, has really rise, raised a lot of attention in the last decade or so. Um, so how does the meta surface do that? The magic lies here in the structure. Of course, the meta surface is a two dimensional sub wavelength arrangement of yeah, designed nanoscale building blocks, often called meta atoms. And yeah, there are different strategies now how this meta surface can interact with the incoming light field. Um, we just heard about Pancharatnam Berry phase or geometrical phase. Um, there are also uh, meta surfaces that rely on propagation phase in very tiny little upright standing waveguides. In our case, um, what I'm going to show you in almost all the projects I'm talking about, our meta surface consists of high index dielectric building blocks that support yeah, me type resonances. So yeah, the basics is basically that if you have such um, high index dielectric nanoparticles, then they support a series of electric and magnetic multipolar modes that can be tailored by the size, shape, material composition, and arrangement of the particles. So for spherical particles, these modes can then be described by me theory. And um, yeah, here I show the schematics of the two lowest order modes from me theory. So this electric dipole mode, which yeah, has a linear displacement current and scatters like an electric dipole. And then the one which raised much more excitement in the last couple of years, um, this um, magnetic dipole mode. So similar to a metallic splintering resonator, this supports a circular current. In this case, it's a displacement current because it's a dielectric material. But this oscillating circular current gives rise to an oscillating magnetic field, and thereby this mode can yeah, efficiently couple also to the magnetic component of light and um, yeah, playing with both of these kinds of yeah, resonances, we have a lot of opportunity to interact and tailor light fields. 
So yeah, one example what we can do. So this was an, an early hologram we did based on this concept. Um, we were basically making meta surfaces with um, so, such silicon yeah, silicon nanocylinder meta surfaces supporting overlapping electric and magnetic dipole resonances. We called this the um, the dielectric Huygens meta surfaces um, because they were really forward scattering, showing a high transmission, and thereby, yeah, we could then, for instance, generate such an holographic image, but also, yeah, impose many other functionalities that have been shown in the meantime with quite high efficiency and, um, yeah, very low aspect ratio structures and efficiencies of, of more than 80%. Also, um, they really, because of the sub wavelength arrangement, these structures work in the yeah, zero diffraction order, which yeah, is, I think for many applications, quite attractive. However, um, of course, as I already mentioned, and as we heard in other talks, there are different ways also to manipulate light field. So how would, should, should we share, care about this process of using these mirrors and particles? And um, yeah, I now have to catch up on the cell phone discussion that was just um, led. So I, I basically funneled in this slide now here at the last minute. So I also was at at a industry meeting a while ago and I got a very similar question maybe like like um, one of the industry ladies raised her hand and asked me yeah um, Isabel this is nice but now which surfaces of a smartphone would you want to replace by your meta surfaces and yeah for a fundamental scientist like me this was quite an applied question yeah but it made me think about this and um, yeah we heard already about replacing these camera lenses and um, yeah, also the previous speaker gave like um, this um, horizon of maybe 10 to 20 years until these could be implemented. And I sort of agree that this is quite difficult to compete here with the current technology, even though it would be really attractive to have this flatter lens for this um, yeah smartphone, which is also flat by nature. Yeah. Um, however, um, yeah, then it's actually relatively hard to think, okay, what can we improve there um, with what we have at the moment? And um, I was sort of making a joke that maybe we can we can make the nice photonic colors to make our smartphones look more attractive. Yeah, but of course, this is not what funding agencies will give us money for. Yeah, so what my view on this is, is really that um, we have to use really the additional functionalities that meta surfaces offer and in particular to be also able to to um, for instance, add new functionalities to this display function, to communication functions, to projecting functions, and so on. What we really need are tunable, light emitting, and nonlinear meta surfaces. So um, the, the passive ones are, of course, also interesting for certain applications. But um, if we want to, yeah, really um, contribute also to to many more components than just um, lenses, beam deflectors, and holograms, then we really need these um, these active meta surfaces that have these additional functionalities. And yeah, in in view, this view, this these resonant meta surfaces that I briefly introduced um, are very attractive because due to their resonant nature, they show a strong spatial and spectral dispersion. That means we have the opportunity to tailor frequency and or angular sensitive optical response. They also facilitate tuning or switching. And um, this you can e easily imagine if you have some strong spectral dispersion and now you manage to shift your peak or dip a little bit. Um, then if you look at one particular wavelength, you can get a really high switching contrast. Yeah? So thereby, therefore, these resonant structures are really favorable. Then, um, yeah, if we look at these meta surfaces, each of the little resonant building blocks is basically acting like a little nano antenna and able to concentrate the electromagnetic near fields and enhance them and thereby enhance yeah, light matter interactions in the near field. And this can then be used to enhance, for instance, spontaneous emission, nonlinear optical effects, or in fact, any light matter interaction um, process. And we cannot just enhance it, but also tailor it. So basically tailor the properties of, of and, and, and um, the, the details of this interaction. So, yeah, so, so we, um, yeah, we're really now after tunable light emitting and nonlinear matter surfaces. And if we think of that, then 2D materials are quite attractive as optical components. So let's review their properties. So when saying 2D materials, in most cases, I'm talking about two-dimensional transition metal dichalcogenides or short TMDs. These are 
yeah, semiconductor materials that when thinned down to the monolayer phase have a direct photonic band gap and therefore show a strong direct band gap photoluminescence in the monolayer phase. They also, due to their specific structure, which is yeah, a non-inversion symmetric crystal structure, so a spin valley coupling effect that um, allows for chiral photoluminescence emission. And here the chirality of the emission depends on um, in which valley, if it's a K or the K prime, K prime valley, the excitons um, that are recombining and emitting light are located. And also a consequence of this non-inversion symmetric crystal structure of the monolayer, it shows a very strong second non order nonlinear response. And finally, the photoluminescence as well as the second harmonic can be tuned by electrical gating in these materials. So we have all the aspects, light emission, nonlinearity, and um, yeah, tuning um, that I mentioned before. Um, and then this should not be neglected. Really, the two-dimensional nature of the TMDs is also yeah, ideal for integration of meta surfaces, which also have this two-dimensional character, basically like putting a slice of cheese on the bread yeah in this case here we have a bilayer yeah but okay take this with a grain of salt so um the tmd really has a monolayer thickness so the this the cheese would be much thinner compared to the bread if we really want to make a quantitative comparison here so yeah, what we're after is basically, or what the idea is, is to um, use metasurface now to enhance the interaction with the ultra thin material by sub wavelength light concentration. And on the other hand, um, use the 2D TMDs to act as active light emitting nonlinear tunable components. So, really, these two, yeah, building or the, these two ingredients, they are helping each other, if you want, yeah, with their respective weaknesses. So the first topic I'd like to go into more detail are light emitting matter surfaces based on 2D materials. And here we have seen this cartoon before for the light emitting matter surface. The idea is now really to get rid of this known input light field and to have the matter surface by itself um, yeah, um, be a flat source of the, of the desired output light field. And um, so basically we would consider now the building blocks of the meta surfaces as resonant dielectric nano antennas that are driven by localized sources and yeah they are basically integrated these nano scale emitters now have to be integrated in the meta surface architecture what can we expect from the meta surface here i um, put a little formula that shows us what the measured fluorescence count rate from a meta surface with a single emitter placed at the position rem on it um, would look like or what factors contribute one is the excitation enhancement um, then one is the quantum yield enhancement of the emitter just um, for instance, um, it's also like per cell enhancement called. Um, then we have the extraction efficiency. So how much light can actually get out now of this metasurface geometry? And finally, the collection efficiency. So here, um, yeah, the emission pattern or characteristics um, play a role. And of course, for a metasurface, typically we don't have a single emitter, but a whole ensemble of emitters that are somehow um, integrated in the metasurface architecture. But then, um, yeah, the theoretical description gets really cumbersome. So if we use dielectric building blocks, um, which I introduced before with mirror resonances, then what we can expect are moderate quantum yield enhancement, um, because just like, for example, compared to plasmonic gap antennas, um, yeah, the near field enhancement is um, yeah not as high, but still there. Um, but what's the big plus point is that the dielectric building blocks have very low absorption losses, so we can expect high radiation efficiencies, in particular if you think of display applications also, then um, yeah, this is really essential because you want um, devices that do not use up much energy. Yeah? So. Then um, to come back to this last point here of collection efficiency. So for this, the directional shaping by the meta surface is also important. Um, and it's um, just to say this often is not just to enhance the brightness or collection efficiency, but also in many cases, we really want a particular pattern. If you think again of the display example, maybe you want to switch your privacy settings um, without losing brightness, for instance, and really die, or maybe you want to use the same screen with another person and looking from different angles. And you can, exp yeah, you can think of many more scenarios where where the pattern really plays a role. 
And in a meta surface, we have now the possibility to use the effect of the array or arrangement in the meta surface. This was already studied in plasmonics, for instance, here in this work by Lozano et al. Um, so if we experimentally investigate patterns, typically what we do is we measure the back focal plane um, of emission. So this is basically the Fourier plane um, and you can read these diagrams um, such that each point here within this circle, which is numerical aperture of the collection objective, corresponds to one direction of emission. And the center point here is basically the direction normally out of the substrate plane. Um, yeah, then, however, we also have the antenna effect from the individual matter atoms and because the dielectric matter atoms support can support these multipolar modes, even an individual antenna can already show highly directional behavior. So basically, if you want to shape emission patterns, we can take or we can utilize both the form factor and the structure or area factor of the meta surface, meaning that we have many degrees of freedom to tailor directional properties. Plus, um, yeah, typically a meta surface is not um, necessarily or not, yeah, that doesn't have to be like a spatially homogeneous um, structure. Like if you think of wavefront shaping, actually meta surfaces are usually spatially variant. Yeah, so these are also aspects um, that can be, yeah, that, that are basically um, topic of current research, like how this can be utilized now in light emission. All right, so let's look at an example of a system we looked at here. So this is a silicon meta surface, um, which is hybridized with a, a monolayer of molybdenum disulfide. So basically we have the silicon cylinders and then we put um, this monolayer of the, um, yeah, of this ultra thin semiconductor on top. <laughs> And um, here, like we're working, as I said, with a group of Andre Tuchanin who are growing these monolayers. So they grow them using a chemical vapor deposition process. And here I just show a microscope image of how such a growth substrate looks like after growth. Yeah. So typically we have many of these um, little MOS2 single crystals. Yeah. So they have this triangular form. And um, yeah, this way it's also, we, we don't have to search for the monolayer. So it's pretty clear from looking at the, at the just at the shape of these flakes um, where the monolayers are and um, that they can, yeah, that we can directly use them. So it's basically also a quite scalable technique as compared to, yeah, exfoliation, which is used a lot in the community. So then what we did is um, we had a process to yeah, transfer the flakes from the growth substrate onto the meta surface structure. Yeah. So, and then we ended up with, with something like this. So here we just see a scanning electron micrograph of the silicon meta surface. In the middle is a cut made with a focused ion beam uh, milling machine and looking at the side with a scanning electron micrograph. So here are the silicon disks again. And then there's still PMMA on top, which is needed for the transfer, but is removed then later on. And um, so the MOS2 is then located here at the bottom of the PMMA. Um, it's just one monolayer, so we cannot see it in the SEM, but I marked it here with the yellow region. Then after removal of the PMMA, we also looked at the light microscope and um, we found here something like this. The dark square is the meta surface and then these lightish, lighter blue areas, these are the MOS2 flakes that have been transferred on top. We now fabricate a series of meta surfaces with a variation of the nano cylinder diameter. And then we yeah, check the emission properties of this yeah, hybrid system. And first of all, we perform photoluminescence microscopy for four different, like, um, yeah, so here I show it for, for four different meta surface diameters. The meta surface is always here within this white dashed area. And um, yeah, then the, where the flakes are, you can see quite prominently. And I think what's clear from just looking at these pictures is that the 2D materials emit more brightly whenever they are located on the meta surface as compared um, when I, they are just located on the substrate. However, I should note that this is actually not a photonic effect in the in the stricter sense, but it's more like um, the surroundings of the material. So basically, when the monolayer sits on a glass substrate, there's always certain roughness um, present and also doping from the substrate. So this um, quenches the emission to some degree. Yeah, it's still present, but it's not as bright. And on the metasurface, surface, um, because we have these little cylinders, the 
um, Thule material is basically freestanding, and this is yeah, favorable for the brightness of the emission. So this is the effect we see here, and we noted this by yeah, checking quantitatively the emission enhancement as a function of the resonance properties, and there was only a small effect. But what the metasurface really does is to shape the emission patterns. And here you show again these black focal plane images for a gradual um, increase of the metasurface cylinder diameter. And this means that we are gradually shifting more and more the metasurface into resonance with the emission of the MOS2. And we clearly see that um, when we are more or less out of resonance, then the then the metasurface guides the light more towards the sides, yeah, so to high angles. Whereas when we're in resonance, um, the light is predominantly emitted out of the metasurface plane. So what we learned from this is that tailoring the emission properties of 2D TMDs by engineering like is possible by metasurfaces, but one really has to take the combined photonic, electronic, and topographic environment into account, and care must also be taken when interpreting photoluminescence enhancement effects. And also we learned that the metasurface is yeah, quite efficient in yeah, shaping the emission pattern of these 2D materials. So, this is just, uh, yeah, basically um, we could have made such kind of experiments also with other types of emitters. We have not um, used so many of the, yeah, of the very unique properties that the 2D TMDs offer. So what's really interesting to look at now is um, to look, yeah, to coupling to these valley degrees of freedom. So I mentioned that the 2D material can emit circularly polarized light depending on in which valley, K or K prime, the excitons were located. Yeah? And um, I show here two works from the literature um, that have already looked at related effects like the separation of valley excitons using such a metallic groove and also um, some valley selective op optical control where a metasurface generated um, local chiral near fields in order to look at photo like chiral photoluminescence later on. Um, what we decided to look at is also valley routing of chiral emission. And here um, we were basing ourselves on yeah, a work by um, Hightow Chen et al. from Australia from 2018, who suggested such a plasmonic antenna here. Um, these are two gold bars of different size um, that can route light of different handedness into different directions in, in space. And um, yeah, we made this in such a plasmonic metasurface in this case, yeah. And um, just because um, the dielectric structures for light emission are still um, quite new, and um, there was already a lot of new things in this study. So at least with the meta atoms, we wanted to stay sort of on the on the safe side, and there was this proposal already, yeah, which we wanted to use. So in this case, we used a monolayer of WSE2 and we um, looked at valley routing of emission um, at um, helium temperature, so 4 Kelvin. Um, so what we found was that um, clearly the, yeah, so, so we saw then all these um, Raman excitronic peaks in the emission. Also, we could um, um, do the valley um, polarization measurement and see that, um, yeah, really um, the light emitted by the metasurface the handedness of the emitted light by the by by this um, coupled system here depended um, yeah on the pump polarization, and um, then we did again this back focal plane imaging and we resolved this now for um, yeah co and cross polarized circular emission and um, yeah what what these images show is the contrast um, for switching the pump polarization. So basically we are we are generating a valley polarized um, yeah ensemble of excitons which is then emitting the light and um, we are detecting in the co-polarized and the cross-polarized channel here and yeah from the colors you see that we already get um, quite a good contrast there are regions um, in space where 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 um, yeah the which are favored um, for emission by one excitation polarization in this case so this is still sort of um, yeah in progress this work um, we just submitted it to a conference, um, but we hope to conclude it soon, hopefully. Um, then um, what's the road ahead for these um, kind of um, light emitting hybrid systems? On the one hand, we want to enhance the complexity of the spatial emission patterns. 
also by by looking at um, spatial variability of the metal surface system we want to dynamically control the emission properties to some extent we've already tried this um, but um, yeah there is still much to do um, we have the plan to look also at lasing at electrical driving schemes um, and also continue fundamental um, studies which would be interesting for valleytronics so for really using this valley degree of freedom um, in the 2d materials so basically in which um, valley k or k prime the excitons are located as an information carrier and using nanophotonics to prepare or read out these kind of states um, yeah, if you're interested in light emitting metasurface in general, not only using 2D materials, but also other implementations, we recently made a big effort in writing this review with um, Femius Kundering's group, and um, there's also a short perspective with Yuri Kivsha. Um, so, but we're quite not, not yet ready with the light emission topic. Um, so. One important step now, um, if you look at the geometries we had so far, we have transferred the whole monolayer on top of the meta surface. But um, in particular, for, for some effects, um, we really want to use some local um, near field property of the nanostructure. And um, in order to get a clean signal, then we want to have the 2D material only in this small region in space. So um, really nanoscale site selectivity of the 2D TMDs um, would be required for many effects. And um, my former postdoc Rajesh looked into this and um, developed a way of nano patterning these um, 2D materials using focused ion beam milling. Um, yeah, so he, he um, basically varied the dose for this and here you see a, um, here you see just the um, atomic force microscopy image of the resulting structure. So we made such such gratings, um, and um, we could we could check then that the grating was properly milled um, by the AFM. Um, we also, of course, were interested in emission properties then, and here you see uh, yeah two flakes, um, one of which was milled, and um, so exactly such a grating was milled in here. The grating, if you if you look at this, like um, is um, the line which um, is just 50 nanometers, so it's too small to be resolved in the optical microscope. But what we see is that the flake is still emitting, however, with lower intensity now. Yeah, and um, so the signal is smaller but still present. And we also observe a blue shift of the emission maximum. Um, yeah, of the excitonic emission maximum um, with the ion dose. Yeah which saturates or however, however, then at some stage. Now, what the actual research question here was, um, was is the valley polarization still preserved by this milling process? So we performed again the valley um, spectroscopy and um, found yeah, these results. So here's the unmilled flake um, where you see this large contrast um, in the um, emission in the two different circular polarized channels and here are two milled flakes and you see that overall the emission is lower but um, the valley contrast here is um, yeah almost preserved so we have it quantitatively here so it goes down a little bit but you see um, if you look at the scale this is um, not that much yeah so we can really conclude that the valley polarization is only slightly affected by the nano patterning and therefore we think that this is a viable route towards um, yeah towards hybrid structures where we have the flakes only in a certain area of the nanostructure. So now I move on to the top topic of the nonlinear metasurfaces. Um, so the mirrors and metasurfaces are very attractive um, platform to look at nonlinear optical effects because they provide this um, resonant near field enhancement and also have a relatively high damage threshold compared to plasmonics just because um, if we operate them in their transparency range, um, yeah, they just not absorb very much light. The 2D TMDs on the other hand provide a strong Chi 2 nonlinearity, so second order nonlinear susceptibility. And um, what can we do with them? So, yeah, the primary experiment is to look at second harmonic generation in these structures. And here again, show such a cartoon with the meta surface here out of the plane of the screen. So, what we have, we will come in with some fundamental light wave. And um, yeah, most of this will pass, but um, a certain fraction of it will be yeah, transformed into a wave which oscillates at double the frequency. The really beauty of looking, using meta surfaces for this is that no phase matching is necessary due to their sub wavelength thickness. This is really some big issue because if you ever made a nonlinear optical experiment using a natural crystal, you know that it's basically 
very difficult to align and phase matching is like a big chapter in every nonlinear optics book. Um, yeah, well, and we don't need it here. Okay, so the first system I want to show you that we used for second harmonic generation um, um, is this one here. So again, so here's a sketch. Again, we have a silicon matter surface. This time it's a bit more complex geometry that supports um, a higher quality factor mode. Um, and the yeah, monolayer MOS2 sits again on top of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, here is also the design a bit illustrated. So we have these bigger and smaller resonators here, and in the array they interact to have um, such optical properties. There's experiment and simulation, so we basically get these two high Q modes. Yeah, and um, while they are not as high Q in experiment as in simulation, they still have relatively high experimental Q factors of about 250 and 100. So we can also look at the intensity of the um, yeah, relevant field components. So what we look at here is, okay, we have here cut through the structure and then we, we look here at the top of the structure and this is in the plane where the um, molybden disulfide monolayer would be sitting. And we're also only looking at the parallel field components at the fundamental frequency. So where we're pumping the system. So that's because the parallel field components are the one that are relevant for second harmonic generation in monolayers as yeah, the nonlinear tensor doesn't have any out of plane elements in the 2D material. Yeah, and um, what we see is that we have quite strong enhancement of the parallel field components in the relevant plane as shown here. So here the scale goes up to um, yeah, 130. Um, so these are now the second harmonic results. So we see that um, if, if you remember, we had these two resonances, yeah, one one for each polarization and one at about yeah, a bit shorter wavelength, like 8, 815 or so, and one around 850. Um, and now we find also in the second harmonic for the two polarizations that we get like a small peak here for the first resonance and a bigger peak here for the second resonance. And um, we can also numerically calculate this using the undepleted pump approximation. And, um, and um, yeah, we get um, results like this, um, which I think um, so, so um, just calculating for the structure, the peaks are quite a bit narrower, but if we um, take into account the finite bits also of the laser pulse, then you see that the results in theory and experiment get already yeah, quite um, qualitatively similar. We can also check the dependence on the pump polarization, which is shown here at the bottom. Again, here is um, on the left-hand side is experiment, on the right-hand side is theory. So if we just have the monolayer on glass, um, the second harmonic that's generated does not um, really depend on the input polarization of the pump. Um, and then, yeah, if we look at the meta surface, then it really depends on the wavelengths of the pump. So um, if we hit the resonance at 8, 10 nanometer, then we get this X polarization. Um, and if we hit the wavelength at 850 nanometer, then we get the Y polarized um, second harmonic as expected. Um, so we also, let's, let's look a bit also quantitatively at the enhancement values that were achieved. Um, so there is this, um, so, so here we, you see a light microscope image showing the structure and the monolayers are here in these regions where, where you see the, um, yeah, these green dashed lines. So basically, um, we have this resonant silicon matter surface of which I discussed the spectra already. We have for reference also unstructured silicon and um, glass here in between, and then also a non-resonant silicon matter surface as we yeah, learned that also the yeah, just being suspended or not, for instance, can also make a big difference on optical properties of monolayer TMDs. So here's then the mapping of the second harmonic. You, we already see that it, it's brightest here in the area of the resonant silicon matter surface. And here on the right-hand side, you also see this quantitatively. This here is a logarithmic scale. And um, so, we see that the largest second harmonic occurs on the meta surface for Y polarized excitation and 850 nanometer wavelengths. Um, the, then we have, um, um, yeah, then we have also the meta surface. Okay, maybe I have to shift this a little bit. Can you see? Yeah, so we had this, um, yeah, this here is this green, um, this green box here, or yeah, this, this green area here. Um, and um, for the other polarization and also for the other resonance, we are already a bit below this value. 
yeah, and then we have glass and the non-resonant silicon metal surface, they are about um, equal and on unstructured silicon, because silicon absorbs up the second harmonic wavelengths, it's much less. So we get an enhancement of about 1,500 compared to unstructured silicon, but this is maybe not a fair comparison because of the absorption, but still about 35 compared to non-resonant wavelengths, which I think is significant. So um, also t we wanted to understand now a bit better because we had these two resonances here. And if you just look at the quality factors, they are actually yeah quite comparable or the one at shorter wavelengths is actually um, yeah supposed to be a bit better. But now um, we learn that um, yeah there are other factors that play a role. And for this, we looked now at the second harmonic. Um, um, at the modes of the structure um, at the second harmonic wavelengths, which are shown here. Um, it does not depend sensitively on frequency here, so we just show it at the same frequency or at the same wavelengths, but it depends a lot on polarization, as you see. And in both cases, because the silicon absorbs, we see that um, on top of the silicon bars, there's basically very little field. So um, if we compare again with the with the images I already showed, which show the yeah transverse field um, like the transverse um, intensity the intensity of the transverse field components um, at the fundamental wavelengths, we see that the resonance at shorter wavelengths has the yeah has the maximum of the intensity on top of the silicon bars, whereas um, yeah, the one at higher frequency has considerable intensity between the bars. And um, so um, we identify here, yeah, that this, um, so it's it's about 50% of the total in-plane pump field between the silicon the silicon bars for this case here. So we have what we what we get is a really good mode overlap between yeah, the pump field and the second harmonic field for the second resonant. And I think this nicely flexed the important role of the silicon absorption and of the spatial field profile at the pump wave wavelengths um, for the success of second harmonic enhancement. Um, so, yeah, I already mentioned that these monolayers have to show the strong second harmonic because of their non central symmetric crystal structure. And um, now I want to stretch a little bit the notion of the meta surface that I introduced in the beginning. And um, we want, we had now the idea to use this milling of the flakes um, to make basically like a super thin meta surface just con consisting of this one molecular layer of the of the of the molybdenum disulfide to make yeah, a nonlinear meta surface. In this case, it's a very simple one. We decided just to go for such gratings first, and if we then checked a mapping of the second harmonic intensity, we saw that it was yeah reduced in this area, but similar as for the photoluminescence, not completely quenched. So we could still measure it. Um, and now we looked um, yeah at the emission characteristics from this. For, so for a simple grating, what we just get because um, even if at the pump this is a non-diffractive structure at the second harmonic where the wavelength is just half um, this becomes a diffractive structure so we um, in the back focal plane we see now not only the central peak but also two diffract like the, the first diffraction order on both sides okay so diffraction works so then we made something slightly more complex and we milled such a fork pattern and um, yeah, it's well known that such fork ratings can generate um, a vortex beam. So this way, with this ultra thin structure, which is just one molecular layer thick, we could generate um, vortex beams in the nonlinear field here in the first diffraction orders. And there was also another group making something very similar to us um, about at the same time. Um, okay, so I have maybe just a few minutes left, but that's okay. I'm um, just to show you also my last topic very quickly on the ultra thin optical matter surfaces. Um, so when I started my talk, I said, um, here is the matter surface. It's basically a sheet of nanoscale thickness. Yeah. But of course, in most cases, that's not entirely true. Of course, the structured layer is, um, yeah, of nanoscale thickness, but Typically, we have a bulk substrate where this layer is sitting on. So, um, if we really like in some for some applications, um, it may be really interesting to have just a meta surface, like a freestanding meta surface, which would um, weigh next to nothing and um, be super compact. Yeah. And um, there was a work also by Stefan Linden's group um, where they milled basically such openings in a metallized carbon film. Um, Problem is that you can only make apertures, but um, no like freestanding matter atoms. Um, so our idea was now to use carbon nanomembranes, which um, are also developed in the group of Andrei Churchanin as substrates for plasmonic matter surfaces. 
And um, here's um, Dinit San, my um, PhD student who worked on this for his master thesis. So basically we want to make these prototypical split ring resonator metasurface on top of such a carbon nanomembrane, which is basically an amorphous carbon structure, which is about a nanometer thick. Yeah? So this image is grossly not to scale, yeah, but we wanted to illustrate this um, character of the nanomembrane. So we developed a fabrication procedure to get the split ring resonators on top of these nanomembranes. Um, there's also, um, yeah, here, here's also a bit shown what the details of this nanomembrane are, how it looks like. And then the first observation we could make, um, yeah, before even processing the metasurface was that these carbon nanomembranes basically don't show any measurable interaction with light. They are almost perfectly transparent, yeah? So, and this is quite good if you want to study metasurface properties without detrimental effect from substrate, which could be blue shifts, it could be additional losses, um, yeah, could be um, detrimental fluorescence and so on. So substrates are often quite annoying. Also, the, the symmetry of the structure can be disturbed by this or is disturbed by the substrate, which is often not wanted and so on. So, um, yeah, we were really um, not, we didn't know if this would work, but um, yeah, I wouldn't be here reporting this um, if it hadn't probably, yeah. So here you see now a TEM grid with these openings. The dark areas are the carbon nanomembranes where we fabricated metasurfaces on. So they are really freestanding carbon nanomembranes. And um, here we have zoomed in on one of these openings a bit more. We see the splitting resonators and then here's a close up showing the splitting resonators sitting now on this one nanometer thick, um, yeah, um, substrate and um, just I thought this broken membrane here shows very nicely also this this very thin character of the substrate. Yeah, long story short, we measured also and and simulated um, the structures. There's nothing surprising here, as um, yeah, splittings are well known, so we could nicely reproduce the characteristics from from theory. And um, what we note is that yeah, um, the resonances look also really beautiful. They are really deep, so one can also already tell that um, yeah, this um, yeah, this detrimental effect from the substrate can be removed here. So it's a typical, otherwise it's just a typical high quality spectra of splitting resonators. And we think this is quite exciting now to have these very thin metasurface because we can now think of stacking them, rolling them up or conformally coating them on other architectures. Okay, so I come to an end of my talk, some concluding remarks. We recently wrote a review on combining near resonant nanostructures with 2D materials. If you're interested in this topic, you can check it out. And um, there's a small outlook, which is now like a, a global outlook. Um, I made a, a small one already for the light emission processes, but um, now, now like more holistically, what we're interested in is to use also the, the possibility to tune um, that's offered by the 2D materials in such hybrid nanosystems to really go towards um, tailored nonlinear and quantum systems. Um, then also to engineer not only the nanostructure, but also the GMD. At the moment, we use just um, WSE2 or MOS2, but um, one, there's also quite a lot of degrees of freedom, like growing alloys or lateral heterostructures, um, vertical heterostructures, and so on, and, and to combine this um, in a metasurface architecture. Yeah, and then we want to look also at such stacked um, metasystems or um, in other words, van der Waals heterostructures that incorporate um, ultra thin metasurfaces, thereby adding additional degrees of freedom of the lateral nanostructuring. Yeah, this is the end of my talk. I want to thank my current team and um, the funding agencies, most importantly, for you for your attention. Yet another um, almost an hour in front of the <laughs> in front of the screen in these Corona times. And um, if you allow me one one last remark, um, we just got a big school on active metasurfaces granted, which will start in October um, together with Australian National University. So one will be able to do a dual PhD degree in this school and there will be seven PhD positions um, announced in this. So if you're interested in a PhD in the near future, um, yeah, um, and even more PhD positions than in the in the next three to four years. Yeah. So maybe check this out and um, or just contact me. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel. It was a lovely talk, and uh, I, I'm sure a very good, uh, very good offer at the end right now. So uh, we have time for we have plenty of time for questions. So please go on. 
Hey, hi, Isabel. Thanks for the nice, uh, nice talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the first paper with the MIA resonators and uh, tungsten disulfide. Was it tungsten disulfide on top? Uh, the first one? Oh, okay, let's let yeah, me go somewhere. With the, oh. uh, with the back focal plane images. Oh, ah, yeah, 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 okay. Uh -huh. So this one here, yeah. 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 The, my question yeah. is, if you have considered the uh, strain caused by these uh, nano resonators, because it, it could also induce some emitters, etc. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, so what we concluded um, for? Okay, it has not loaded the image, but so let me go back maybe and forth again. Maybe no. Yeah. So, um, so we were actually quite puzzled in the beginning when we could, when we saw that. Um, we saw this enhancement, so we were happy. And then once we started analyzing it in more detail, um, yeah, we saw that it's not this photonic effect. So um, there are different factors now contributing to this, and strain is one of them. Yeah, but it's it's not so much. So so what actually happens when the when the material is then freestanding? It's more or less um, releasing the strain. Yeah. It can just um, sit there then happily and and be in its state how it wants to be. However, on the substrate, um, there there are all these uh, microscopic um, roughnesses, and they can locally lead to quite um, quite a lot of strain. Yeah, if you feel like this is maybe bent over a, a, a piece of roughness or so, and this messes up then locally the band structure and um, can even lead to yeah transitions from direct to indirect band gap and so on. Yeah, so we think that this plays a role, but analyzing it really in detail was um yeah not possible for us in this work yeah so we basically tried to understand um yeah the factors based on the spectra and so on but um like i think really going into detail one would need some yeah some other techniques as well like really looking at the with atomic resolution what's happening there or also yeah but um i think that strain or we concluded that strain is is one of the factors and it's basically like this um yeah, not like one one tensile or compressive strain that has the whole flake, but more like a local strain that varies on position and messes up the band structure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. I might have a question related to this one. Uh, actually, uh, have you considered either embedding uh, the tungsten uh, disulfide uh, into HBN, uh, covering the metal surface by some flat layer. Like uh, I don't know whether there's yeah. a possibility to to uh, deposit uh, something really flat, but uh, I believe it might be possible. Yeah, so we have considered this. Um, we didn't have um, HBN available as a material, and also this was, um, yeah, I mean, this was published 2019, but was started um, quite a bit earlier. You know how it is, yeah. Um, yeah. So at this point, um, when we started it, we actually didn't think of this, and um, even now, it's a bit hard to have this available um, for us. Um, but what's already clear is that this would be a very good idea in many cases, because um, what was shown um, by Andre Trichanin with some collaborators um, who did the, I, I don't remember now the name, yeah, but um, they also got the flakes from Andre Trichanin's group and encapsulated them. They are not looking at metasurface or so, just at the material itself. And they could show that by encapsulation in HBN, um, the CVD grown flakes in their properties became very close to yeah, highest quality exfoliated crystals. And this was sort of a, an important study because um, you even now read quite often in the literature that the CVD grown flakes have lower quality. But in many cases, this is um, this is due to the growth substrate by itself. Yeah. So if you have it on a growth substrate, there's also inherent strain, um, and yeah, other factors um, that are detrimental for for yeah for the excitonic properties, for instance. Yeah. So yeah, it's an excellent idea. Um, I would like to do this. I'm not sure if we can always. Yeah. Depends on availability of material and also. Of, of these techniques, like um, if at the moment we grow and then we, we can rely on having many of these flakes everywhere. Um, typically people encapsulating do this, um, if I'm not mistaken, by like, um, yeah, often they, they use exfoliated materials and stack them on top of each other. So it's typically something something local that you can, like when you make a fundamental study, it's easy to do that there. But if we want a meta surface and we want to have flakes on each of these meta surface, like more scalable, yeah, to be able mm -hmm. to, to compare it, then so far we don't know how to do this. But um, yeah, we're very interested in learning. So if you have an idea, we're very open. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.
So maybe may I ask you it's related. Have you found some particular difficulties in patterning, nano patterning of of those uh, um, um, those two D materials? Um, so with the FIB, um, what we did there, the patterning itself, so, so it was also, um, it went on also quite a bit longer than I expected in the beginning. Yeah. So the first thing we noted was that these, um, atomic force microscopy images were very confusing because, um, the material seemed to be higher in the milled regions and we thought that we're taking away material, so it should be smaller. Yeah, but what's actually happening is that ions get implanted into the substrate <laughs> and thereby. Um, yeah, this is sort of swelling and um, yeah, then basically the milled regions because we're just mill a very tiny bit, just 1 layer. Yeah, so, so they actually get larger. Or, or higher than the surrounding areas. Also, um, what is a bit of a problem? I mean, you can guess it from this image. Um, so the, if you look at the scale bar, um, the, we have about like, like, if you look at these gratings, they are about a fill factor of about 50, 50, yeah. But the emission is reduced here by more than 50%. So what we also have is, um, basically in the tails of the ions, um, there are so, so we have this focused iron beam, but it has tails. And um, so the non milled regions will still see some ions and um, these can induce some damage and so on. And then, yeah, it was really the, the, the critical factor was to use as, as low as possible doses to do this. Yeah. So that this damage is basically minimized, but we could not get rid of this completely. Right. So there's still some damage as you see in the change of the, of the, um, like in, in this, yeah, decrease of the emission strength. Um, but, um, yeah, Rajesh also made quite a careful analysis then of all these optical properties. So this blue shift of the exciton peak, for instance, um, this is not really damage, but this is, um, release of strain in the structure. When you mill, then this material can, um, yeah, expand to its actual size and is not, um, blocked by the substrate anymore to with the sticking. Yeah. Uh, and have you tried, uh, uh E beam lithography as well for patterning of the this this was um yeah I, I would like we haven't really yeah so um we, this was our first idea to use e beam lithography. What the problem is um is that there are some works demonstrating it. So I think etching the materials and so on is no problem at all. But in the end, what we want are like little islands of the material, for instance. Mm -hmm. And typically you have to use a negative E beam resist then. And um, as far as I understand, it's really hard then to get rid of this resist without harming the flake. So maybe with a positive resist like PMMA that can be quite easily removed later on, this would be possible, but then it's again, then it's difficult to make like small islands. So it's probably a, a question of finding then the right resist and the right, um, yeah, procedure to strip this resist after patterning. And we, yeah, I think we will probably look into this, um, at some stage. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, of the, be. of this damage, um, that the ions induce, but yeah, for the moment, um, we can, for the plants we have, I think we're quite happy also with the focused yes. ion beam procedure. And I have the last question as well. Uh, what about the PL microscopy? I guess it has been done done as a far field microscopy. Yeah, Again, this is far field, field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as well. Have you um, tried near field or not? No, we have not done near field. Yeah. Okay. Thank Maybe you. something like this is now going on in the group of Thomas Perch, who does a lot of near field microscopy, but um, I'm not so sure. Like I'm not in involved in this. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure.